Members, the sitting is resumed and we move to questions to the Minister for the Infrastructure. I call Mr George Robinson. Question one, Mr Speaker. Yes, Performance of bus and rail services provided by Translink, uh, including NI Railways, is independently monitored and results published twice a year. The results of the Spring 2016 Monitor were published on the 22nd of September 2016 and show that NIR exceed the charter targets for punctuality and overall achieved a perfect score of 100% for reliability, which is a very credible performance indeed. Detailed analysis of punctuality data is compiled per services and reviewed on a daily, weekly and monthly, 26-week and annual basis by NIR. Poorly performed services are then monitored and action plans developed to enhance performance. When disruption does occur, NIR act immediately to minimise delays and return services to the planned timetable. My department monitors performance on an ongoing basis as part of the conditions of the service agreement entered into with Translink in October 2015. I am aware of a number of delays on the Derry to Coal Rain line, which arose in early December 2016 following the activation of the new signalling. It is clear that the performance issues at that time were not satisfactory, but Translink has worked hard with the contractor to address these issues during the bedding in period. I am also aware that following the recent refurbishment project, the Belfast to Dublin Enterprise Service experienced a series of service delays. In response to my concerns, a joint service improvement team has been established representing NI Railway and Irish Rail with the objectives of addressing performance issues associated with the enterprise service. I expect to see improvements in these services going forward. Call Mr. Robinson for a supplementary. I thank, <coughs> thank the Minister for his reply. <coughs> but having experienced a lengthy delay on uh, <coughs> the railway and observed at first hand the disruption to passengers, and staff, I, I would urge the Minister to have an urgent conversation with Translink about replacing the current strategy they have in place, as, in my opinion, it's not fit for purpose. Well, well, of course I do regularly have conversations with Translink. We have discussed the, um, the recent uh, delays on the Derry to Cold Rain, which the, the member uh, alludes to. Um, you know, this is an issue regarding barriers at Ballerina and a faulty track circuit at Castle Rock. Uh, I think you go too far um, to suggest that we need an entire different, entirely different approach to this, uh, and that simply is, is not to the standard it should be. I say I go back to my original answer, uh, which with the 2016 results show a perfect score of 100% for reliability, which indeed is a fantastic score and fair play to all of those that achieved that. Call Jenny Palmer. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his uh, responses thus far. Uh, what actions is the Minister taking in conjunction with the PSNI and the Justice Minister to address the constant delays in the north-south corridor at Lurgan with security alerts? I thank the Member for her question. As I said, in, in, in response to my concerns of the uh, a joint service improvement team has been put in place um, to look at all different aspects of how we improve this line. Um, we're, th this will not be alone, obviously, looking simply at issues such as security. Um, I have no doubt that that perhaps may be something that this group does indeed look at. Call Mr. Justin McNulty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his, for his answers thus far. Minister, in recent days, uh, you've been spreading fake news making statements about Newry Rail Services and Narrowwater Bridge. How can that work when your colleague, the Finance Minister, has not even brought forward a budget? Are you not ashamed of making empty promises to the good people of Newry Armagh, who I am proud to represent, filling them full of hope about improved rail services, about developments that may never happen? Are you not ashamed of yourselves? You are making, you're making you're putting out fake news. I think the only person that should be ashamed is the member. Uh, I, the people of Newry will experience improved rail services as a result of me making these decisions. Uh, I'm not sure if the member has been, has been aware or has been awake uh, in recent weeks, but I will remain the Minister for Infrastructure over the next number of weeks. Uh, I will be in position. Uh, I have had conversations with Translink. We have talked about the enhancements that are needed in Newry. That is why they are now going to review the situation with services in Newry 
and they're going to enhance where necessary. So that's the situation. This isn't fake news. I don't, I don't get into the realm of fake news. And as I said, as the people I've been talking to in Newry over the last few days are very, obviously very clearly different to the people that the member uh, for Newry and Armagh has been talking to over the last few days, because local people are excited by the fact that they're going to see improved rail services. As I said, I have, I have, this year, I have also announced, as you've seen, that there is a joint service between ourselves and in Dublin about improving the service line. This isn't fake news. Before I call Mr Sidney Anderson, I should inform members that question 7 and question 13 have been withdrawn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question 2. The report was an evidence-based study which sought to obtain facts from a wide range of stakeholders covering farming, engineering, environment and governance. It is clearly well informed, wide ranging and challenging, and I am very impressed by the extensive nature of the engagement carried out. I believe that the considerable time taken to listen to those impacted by last winter's flood was time well spent. The findings in the report are set out using the theme of resilience throughout, and it focuses on a number of sectors such as farmers, staff, and land use. Importantly, the report highlights that flooding is not something that can be solved but it is a reality that we must learn to live with and to manage. My department is currently preparing an action plan to allocate responsibility for progressing the recommendations within the report through the Flood Strategy Steering Group, as this includes representation from other departments. Mr Anderson, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the Minister for that response. But, uh, Minister, you will be well aware of the damage and, uh, that was caused to land, property and businesses in Upper Ban. And uh, I'll refer to uh, along the Loch Shore there at Kinnego and at the Birches uh, and Mahri areas of Portadown. Uh, in light of your answer, what, what really assurances can you give to those people? Those people are living in fear times of they get this again, and certainly they cannot go through that. Uh, what assurances can you give that the recommendations of this report will be fully carried out, and also that uh, rural dwellers? any criteria that it will be looked at to ensure that those rural dwellers, uh, each one is specific, and I don't know about compensation, that it will help those rural dwellers, that everyone be looked at in a, in a specific manner to suit their needs. Thank you. Uh, well, the member is correct to talk about the resilience in the rural community, and indeed, uh, Mr Strong points to this. You know, and there, there were five commendations uh, in the report. Uh, the first, obviously, was for distinct leadership by the then Dard Minister Michelle O'Neill and the Chief Executive David Porter of Rivers Agency during the, during the period, the notable support and guidance by the Ulster Farmers Union, uh, and the third one was the strong resilience by many in the rural community. And this goes wider than just flooding. We know in periods of um, very cold and ice and snowy conditions the rural community stands up. Um, the vision to engage with natural flood management systems and the sustained efforts by emergency planning groups and community resilience and services. The one word that repeats itself throughout this is resilience. I think there is an acceptance amongst uh, governments uh, that, you know, again, it's not a situation of eradicating flooding, it's something we have to manage, and that is the position that we're coming to. Um, so in dealing with how do we then go forward, the 10 high-level recommendations cover areas including increased research and development into our farming practices and floodplains, improvements to communications during flood events, collaboration to further develop the multi-agency approach, a focus on civil contingency and emergency planning, and connecting resources to make the best use of our collective skills. An action plan is being drawn up by officials from Rivers, and given that input from other departments is required, this will then be taken forward by the Flood Strategy Prevention Group. Call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, I, like Mr. Anderson, have met with many of these homeowners, farmers, and businesses in Upper Ban, which have been affected and livelihoods have been put at risk. Many farmers have been there for generations, and they do fear that it's Groundhog Day. So how can they have the confidence? What can you do to reassure them that they have the confidence that this review will make any difference whatsoever? Well, I too, in, in my short time in, in post thus far, have, have been into the areas that have suffered badly, uh, and there is that great sense of frustration. Um, but what struck me, and as I said to the previous member, is that sense of acceptance that you know, we are we are. We need now to learn how, to, how do we live with this, but how do we ensure it doesn't ruin our lives uh, every winter? And I think that's a situation we've got to. And again, the other thing that strikes me is the farming community are central to this, and again, will be central to the flood strategy steering group and the recommendations are going forward. This isn't a plan that will be 
um, foisted upon local communities. This is the plan that local communities will play a central part in taking forward. Call Ms. Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, as the Minister knows, I come from a constituency with the longest coastline in Northern Ireland, but what assurances can the Minister give that coastal management will actually be dealt with um, and that my community and my constituency will not be again ignored when it comes down to winter flooding caused by coastal erosion? Well, coastal erosion is an issue I have been dealing with uh, on uh, two or three separate occasions. I've had meetings now with uh, my, my colleague Michelle McElveen, the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Minister. Uh, and it is something I have no doubt that the departments will continue to work on. I too come from a constituency in South Down uh, that suffers from the likes of this in, in places like Kalock and Restrever and Warren Point in recent years. I know how important it is. Um, there is work going on um, to develop the best way forward. Uh, and first of all, I think most importantly, to assess exactly where it is we stand. Um, I know Scotland have taken out uh, work over the last number of years on, on assessing where exactly they stand in relation to their coastline, uh, and I think that's something there's merit in us doing here as well. Call Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question three. The issue of international passenger transport is being considered as part of a detailed assessment of the potential impact of a, of a, of a withdrawal from the EU. All of these considerations will feed into negotiations going forward. However, it is essential to make sure that British government ministers keep at the forefront of their thinking the unique set of circumstances that apply on the island of Ireland when it comes to passenger transport. There are many journeys across the border every day with passengers travelling for work, education and leisure purposes. It is very important that people in the north and south continue to have a choice of transport services at their disposal and can, can enjoy free movement on this island when and where they wish. That said, it is too early to make an informed assessment of any impact on the North's international passenger transport arising from a withdrawal from the EU. This will largely depend on the terms of the relationship that is eventually agreed with the EU. My officials are engaged with officials in DFT, the EU Exit Coordination Unit, to ensure that they include in their thinking the specific issues that impact here on the island of Ireland. Ms. Bradshaw, for a supplementary. Thank you, and thank you, Minister, for your uh, answer. Um, you, you mentioned there about an informed as, uh, assessment, but what plans do you have around changing the current passenger transport operating legislation to align more with the Republic of Ireland and the rest of Europe, as you outlined? It is very important those, those transport links, or do you? Is, are you minded to continue with the current UK derogations? I think it's fair to say that this is a fluid situation. Even today, the British Prime Minister has made a statement that I think will be deeply worrying um, to, to public transport uh, and passenger transport providers here in the island of Ireland. Uh, I think that if there's one thing that has come out of the statement today from um, the, the Prime Minister is that, that a hard border looks like an inevitable situation here at the minute, and that will deeply be concerning. So it is a very fluid situation, but rest assured that it is one that my officials in relation to officials in Dublin and London have certainly on their agenda. Mr William Irwin is not in his place. I call Ms Rosemary Barton. Question five. The processes and procedures operating in Fermanagh South Tyrone are no different from anywhere else, and these processes were reviewed following a period of prolonged ice and snow during November and December 2008, which resulted in the closure of a number of rural schools. The, the disruption at that time prompted the then Minister for Regional Development, Conor Murphy, to ask officials to carry out an examination of its operational response to areas around rural schools, and in particular those that were regularly affected by adverse weather conditions. This exercise resulted in a revised winter service policy, which provided priority secondary shelter to schools which had a history of closure due to inaccessibility associated solely with the presence of snow or ice on the adjacent network. It was recognised that it would not be possible to try and salt all roads to such schools, and the secondary salting is therefore carried out on the shortest route from the school to a road in the salting schedule. I should highlight that the secondary salting occurs after the main salting schedule has been completed and when there remains problems with ice and snow on untreated roads. It does not occur in response to normal frost conditions when such roads are passable with care and would benefit little from the application of salt as they would not experience the substantial traffic needed to disperse the salt solution across the carriageway. Well, Ms Barton, for a supplementary. Thank you. 
Minister, as you'll be aware, not all of the roads, uh, not a, the main entrance to a school is very often not on the main road, and it's on another road that is not on the gritting route. Can you give consideration to that road being salted and gritted? Well, as I've just outlined, uh, it is an entirely unrealistic to expect that the department is able to salt every single rural road, in particular right across the north. Uh, it just simply would not be affordable or practical in any sense. Um, so we have to prioritise. Uh, and as I said, when it comes to schools, uh, I think the best solution here is uh, to salt that road, that route uh, of the shortest distance. Um, I would appeal, and I think I, I make two appeals here, that of course, and schools do, schools go above and beyond what's expected of them to ensure their entrance and, uh, and around the school is taken safely. But the government can't be around every corner with salt in a bucket. We need to make sure the drivers take that extra bit of care. We've been fairly fortunate so far this winter that the winter has been mild. Um, but as I said, we are talking here about millions of pounds invested uh, into salting our, our, our network, uh, and we do that. You would be talking of hundreds of millions of pounds if we were then to, to expand it out to every single rural road. Uh, and I'm sure nobody in this chamber would be calling for that. Call Mr. Richard McPhillips. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his an answer so far. In terms of access to schools, especially on roads in South Romana that are prone to flooding, can the Minister provide an update on the works promised over a year ago to be undertaken on the Wattle Bridge Road, Newton Butler, Derry Lane Road, Smith Strand, Liston Ski, and the Inish Moor Road, Lisbella? Uh, as this question is relating to salting and not actually to the, the question the Minister is, or the member uh, is raising, I'd be more than happy to correspond with the member if he, if he wants to write in. I'm sure he's able to get onto a website and to see the department's uh, address. Oh, Mr. Trevor Lund. Thank you. I can't call you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I cashed ever a shay. That, that's number six, Minister. Mr. Uh, I, refer, I refer you to my previous answer to this issue uh, that was issued to yourself on the 19th of September. Uh, at this time, the, the situation ha, ha, remains unchanged. My department is aware of congestion suffered by commuters using the A1-M1 junction and has a long-term proposal to provide a new road link between the A1 and the M1 motorway bypassing Sprucefield. The proposed scheme, which falls within Transport and I's strategic road improvement programme, will benefit strategic traffic by avoiding delays in the Sprucefield area. The proposed scheme was taken to a preliminary stage of development, which identified two possible route options, but further options will need to be examined. The executive is currently focused on delivering its capital flagship projects and there is insufficient funding to continue with the development of this scheme. Further development of the scheme will be dependent on the availability of finance through future budgetary statements. On a more general note, my department is progressing the development of new transport plans in line with the new approach to regional transportation, and this will set out a long-term programme of investment. Development of these plans will provide an opportunity for all strategic roads across the north, including the upgrade to the M1 A1 link, to be considered for future funding. Mr. Lund, for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. I must say I don't recall asking an identical question in September, but fair enough, same issue. Um, could he update us then on the associated work which may have to go ahead, uh, at, known as the Knockmore link? Which, which would obviously have a bearing on, on the overall strategic plan. In the Belfast Metropolitan Transport Plan 2015, the Knockmore to Sprucefield Link Road, known as the M1 Knockmore Link, has been identified as a developer-led proposal. This means that it is the responsibility of the developers of adjacent land to deliver this road scheme as part of their development. I understand that Lisburn and Castlereagh City Council is currently considering how this scheme could help unlock development potential in the West Lisburn area. The Council is aware that the limited capital funding available to my department is directed towards the maintenance and improvement of the strategic road network and that it is highly unlikely that any financial contribution can be made towards this scheme could be justified at this time. Currently, when compared against the demand for other major road schemes, it would not be a priority. It is an issue that I have had discussions with local representatives on. Uh, I understand the importance of this to the local area, but as I've laid out, I believe there is scope um, for progress on that, and that scope uh, will be in relation to the developers and the local council. Well, Mr. Robbie Butler. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, on, on that very same subject, the North Feeder Road, was there a commitment uh, from your department at any stage to uh, part fund that road? And is this, is, this, is this a change in tact or direction from yourself? I'm not aware uh, of any commitment, certainly. Um, since coming into post, it's not something that I have addressed that. So, as far as I'm aware, it isn't a change of direction. I certainly haven't given any um, direction to change um, instruction on this. Um, so, I think just succinctly, I'm not aware of any previous uh, direction on that. Call Mr. Philip Logan. Question number eight, please, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to confirm that collision remedial work at the Cromkill Road, Lis Navina Road at Junction, is programmed to commence within the next few weeks. Though this work to prohibit the right turn from Cronkill Road towards Antrim will directly address the primary causation factors of recent collisions where traffic turning right out of Cronkill Road have been struck by northbound vehicles on the Lisnavina Road. There are two viable alternative routes for traffic wishing to travel south on the A26 from the Cronkill Road and Colgorm Road area of the town. Both routes use the Seven Towers roundabout, and both are considered a reasonable and safer alternative to crossing the busy northbound carriageway of the A26. Mr. Logan, first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for the, for the answer. Um, given that on that stretch of road alone on the uh, 6th of January of this year, uh, six accidents occurred, would the Minister consider reviewing the actual safety of that road itself? Thank you. Well, indeed, this is a piece of work uh, that has been carried out uh, in the past. Uh, that particular stretch of road has been a focus for the Department. Uh, the report uh, and the recent safety report also recommends a number of low-cost site-specific measures to be implemented in the short term. These include the provision and the review of street lighting at Wood Green and Barnish Road, a review of signs and lines along the entire route to ensure clarity and consistency, as well as the legislative change to ban the right turn at Wood Green Road and Cronkill Road, as detailed above. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you. Um, these various junctions on the Snevna Road have been horrendous in terms of their records. So I'm interested to know why was the original plan to attend to the junction at Main Road abandoned? Because that does, having, having been a junction identified in need of remedial works, it does seem rather odd that the remedial works or any plan for them have been abandoned. Well, I'm not aware of any plan for remedial works being abandoned. Uh, again, it's certainly not a decision that I have, have taken or a decision that I am aware of. Um, as, I've, as I've outlined to the, to the previous question to Mr. Logan, uh, there are a number of recommendations, uh, a number of low-cost specific site recommendations that I think will take place over the short to medium term that will help uh, provide greater safety uh, to commuters on that stretch of road in the future. Mr. Adrian McQuillan is not in his place. I call Ms. Sandra Overend. Ms. Sandra Overend is not in her place. I call Mr. Keith Buchanan. Thank you. Uh, question number 11, please. My department has the ability to regulate and control traffic using powers provided in the Road Traffic Regulation Order 1997. These powers include being able to both prohibit and restrict parking, as well as providing parking places. We generally employ parking prohibitions or restrictions to resolve traffic progression and road safety issues in order to keep traffic moving in a safe and efficient way. A decision to provide any measure, whether it is intended to prohibit or restrict parking or indeed provide parking, will be based on local circumstances. Provision may also be a part of an overall transport plan for an area. Parking prohibitions and restrictions and parking provision are generally indicated on the road using traffic signs and road markings, which are prescribed under the Traffic Signs Regulations 1997 or otherwise authorised by my department. As well as providing essential road user information, the traffic signs also help ensure that road space is used in the way intended by facilitating enforcement by our traffic attendants. In the case of Coal Island, there are relatively few parking restrictions when compared to other towns. There have been numerous attempts in the past to introduce parking restrictions. However, these were opposed by local people, local shop frontagers and public representatives. Mid Ulster Council is currently planning the delivery of a public realm scheme in Coal Island. During the development of this scheme, the provision of parking and the need for any restriction on parking will then be reviewed. 
Well, Mr. Buchanan for a supplementary. Thank you, and thank the Minister for his answer. Could the Minister confirm to me, in reference to Kill Island, the lack of red coats, which seems to be the only town that I'm aware of in my constituency, and certainly across my colleagues, all there is, that the term red coat doesn't exist? Is there a fear of red coats in, the, in that town for whatever reason? Well, I'm, I'm glad the member has done a survey of all the towns in his district to, to detect the number of red coats and when they're operating. Um, but there are a number of reasons why. Um, you know, that this, is, this may be the situation and the situation you're alluding to. The department's parking enforcement contractor deploys traffic attendants to any town or city that has parking restrictions. In order to maximise effectiveness and efficiency under the enforcement contract, traffic attendants are deployed to those places where they will have the most impact upon road safety and or traffic progression. Coal Island has relatively few parking restrictions when compared with other towns. My department's parking enforcement unit carried out a short trial of enforcement in Coal Island on three occasions in 2016. This resulted in two warning notices being issued over the three visits. I call Mr. Christopher Stalford. Question number 12, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Better late than never. Uh, I can advise that my department does aim to minimise congestion on the highway network as far as is practical. The A24 Sainfield Road corridor, which extends into Carriduff, carries some 30,000 vehicles per day, and in this respect, some level of congestion during peak travel times is inevitable. Carriduff itself is restricted by the existence and operation of three major junctions in relatively close proximity, these being the A24 Ballinahinch Road, Church Road, Hillsborough Road, Staggered Signalised Junction, the A7 Sainfield Church Road, Cumber Road, Staggered Signalised Junction, and the Carriduff Roundabout. In general, the operation of the traffic signals on the St. Field Road corridor and indeed all arterial routes into Belfast are monitored by staff at the Transport NI Traffic Information and Control Centre using their CCTV network. This allows for the optimum control strategies and signal timings to be used along the route to ensure minimum delay to all road users. Should you have a specific junction or location in mind, my department officials would be more than happy to look into this. Mr. For supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister to outline if there are any plans to expand park and ride schemes in the area around Carriedoff? Um, particularly, I think um, folks living in the centre of the village or the town do find it very frustrating that uh, during weekdays um, congestion, especially coming from the direction of uh, the Minister's constituency into Belfast, uh, does cause problems for people that live in the town. Yes, and look, I'm delighted that there are people seeking enhanced services in our, our park and ride. Uh, the current Hill park and ride is probably the most relevant one, has been a huge success. It takes hundreds of vehicles off the St. Field Road every day, uh, perhaps saving us you know, close to two kilometres of congestion every single day. So that has been a huge success. Uh, I have seen plans for a second wave of park and ride facilities right across the north. These will uh, start to roll out uh, in the future months. Uh, these do include uh, the likes of Clock uh, and Down Patrick in my, in my own constituency, uh, and that will alleviate some of the traffic, as, as you mentioned, coming in. Um, but I think certainly the, the message for those in Kaidoff is that you know, not only does the, the, my Greenway plan, which I outlined lately, um, but the Belfast Bicycle Network plan, which should be rolled out very shortly also, uh, will include a greenway uh, from carried off into the, into the city centre, which allows people to be able to cycle in uh, and to get off the road, uh, but also that you're on the main bus routes uh, as well. Um, so the message also to those people is maybe to decide to, to get off the road themselves in carried off and to get on to public transport. But uh, as I said in my original answer, if there's a specific junction in mind, I know there's a couple of uh, fairly large housing developments coming into the carried off area in future. Uh, and my, my officials will be more than happy to liaise with you on that. Well, Mr. Chris Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister whether the Belfast Cycle Network Plan will help to ease congestion in the area and if he could update the House in regards to that plan? Uh, I hope it will. I absolutely do hope it will. Uh, I think as, as Belfast continues to grow and grow into areas such as carried off from the Four Winds and everywhere else, uh, I think the demand, um, as you, and you see, I, I regularly travel that road myself. You see the amount of people using the buses. You see the amount of people cycling and walking. Uh, so it is a prime contender to, to do that. And yes, both, as I, as I said in my original answer, my, my Greenways plan and the vision for the future and the Belfast uh, network plan 
will include faci increased facilities to, to meet the demand for cycling in that part of the world. Uh, and I hope that the member won't have to wait too much longer before he sets eyes on the plan. That concludes the time for listed questions. We now move to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mr. Patsy McGlone. I guess we have selection area. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the minister too. In relation to a number of flagship key projects that had been announced by the executive, I including those uh, the A5, the A6, the Belfast Rapid Transport, and Belfast Transport Hub. Uh, can the minister assure the house, and indeed more importantly, those people depend upon those, not least of all the construction industry, that there is a commitment and a definite surety that they will in fact proceed now in the event of our institutions having collapsed. Absolutely, and I'm glad the member has taken the time to, to raise this particular issue. Uh, as you've outlined, the flagship projects are executive priority flagship projects. I have had discussions with uh, my colleague, the Minister for Finance in the Finance Department, um, and it is very clear that the funding remains uh, in place. These are priorities going, going forward. And I, as Minister, have left clear instructions of my ministerial priorities going forward on a number of issues which, ought, which will include the flagship executive priority projects such as the A5, the A6, uh, the Belfast Transport Hub and, of course, the Belfast Rapid Transit, which is due to come live next year. Mr. Malone, for supplementary. Uh, while I understand those will be your priorities up until such times as you are no longer Minister, um, can the Minister give an assurance that they will stick in place post your time there and that, in fact, the commitment of £75 million from the Irish Government to Phase 1 of the A5 will remain secure? And what discussions have you had with the Irish Government in relation to that? Well, the first point to make sure is that the £75 million is not enough. Uh, and I have had discussions with the Southern Government on this particular issue. I have met Shane Ross and we have discussed the need uh, to go back to the original uh, mention, the 400 million, and that is the figure that we need to be seeing on the table to, to, to move forward a lot of this. Uh, but rest assured, the member should be rest assured uh, that these flagship executive priority projects will be moving forward in the years ahead. Call Mr. Harold McKay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, early on when you took the new role as Minister, you did say you had prioritised a thousand resurfacing or repair jobs within Northern Ireland as a whole. Could you tell me what progress has happened? Are you on target or is it completed? Yes, we are well on target. Uh, I believe now nearly two thirds of the roads have been completed. Uh, we probably would have done a lot more, but um, NI Water were due to lay mains in some areas and some utility contractors were going to. So instead of doing the resurfacing and then that having to be dug up, we have decided to hold back in a number of places for that utility work to take place and then to come in afterwards to do resurfacing. So no, it has been a huge success. Um, you know, everywhere you go and you talk to people in rural communities, the, the state of rural roads has certainly been a big issue. It was a big issue uh, in the last election uh, and certainly in the election that uh, comes up to us, people will obviously be raising uh, the, you know, state of roads and, and that thing. But I would like to think that this year, maybe the angst on the doors might not be just as high as it was the last time. Mr. McKee, for a supplementary. Yeah, thanks, Minister, for your answer this far. We, we've hardly got a chance to go holes in the roads since the last election. Could I, could I just ask, uh, the reason I do ask the question was because I had written to you within your first week of office in relation to two roads, Cargany Road and Mill Road in Kilkeel, which were in very bad state of repair. Could I ask, are they on target? Have they yet to be done? Again, I, I don't recall the answer that I would have provided to yourself at, at that time. Uh, but again, look, I'll make a commitment that I'll, I'll go away and, and we'll look at that and come back to the member on the reasons or the situation with regards to those two roads. Well, Mr. Christopher Stalford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the minister announced uh, recently uh, a residents only parking uh, pilot scheme in my constituency. Uh, I welcome that. I think it will, be, it will obviously be welcomed by those constituents of mine who have had their life uh, made misery uh, in the Holy Lands area. Um, given the uh, speed with which we are moving towards a collapse of devolution, can the Minister give constituents of mine an assurance that the scheme, if the pilot is successful, will actually be expanded, whether there is a Minister in place or not? 
And again, I think we have to take into cognizance the fact that you know people are asking these types of questions. Um, but you know, I'm pleased to say that look, it's not just me as the political head, I suppose, of my department, but officials that are keen for these schemes to go ahead. Uh, and you know, as we do progress a number of these schemes, uh, you know, I certainly have confidence that they will roll out. Um, there's no doubt that there's a big, even since this story hit the headlines, there's a big demand for residence parking schemes across the board. Um, but look, that is something that we're going to have to deal with uh, in the months ahead. Um, certainly, uh, you know, I hope I'm in a position to be able to do that. Um, but as I said, if, if the members party maybe had to take in uh, different actions ahead of Christmas, I could have provided a bit more clarity than what I'm able to today. But the message is clear to those constituents that this is a, this is a priority for my department. The, the value and the justification for residence parking schemes is not just something that rests with the head of the department, but certainly with my officials also. Mr. Stalford, for supplementary. I, I admire the, the Minister for Infrastructure's chutzpah. If you slam a Mercedes into a wall, don't blame the passengers for the state that it's in. Um, I think it's important that uh, people should have confidence that these schemes are going to be expanded. In that uh, vein, can the Minister tell us when the report will be brought back to the Department on the success or otherwise of the pilot scheme? Well, as far as thinking back to that time, I, I think I was due to receive that report in around uh, the summertime. Um, so, as I say, that's the situation we're at. Uh, but to, let's make no bones about it. Th this situation would be a hell of a lot different if the members' party did take a, a different course of action prior uh, and after Christmas. Uh, and this is no hoodspot. Called Mr. Roy Beggs. <coughs> Minister, on the 6th of January, I received an email from your department's uh, Infrastructural Equality Unit uh, advising that they had screened out from Section 75 uh, some aspects of the programme for government, in particular, uh, government indicator 23 and 25. Did you approve of that? Again, I'm not aware of the email uh, that you're referring to. If you want to, to, to correspond with myself on this over the next few days, we'd be more than happy to do so. Under the programme for government indicators 23 and 25 and what we propose to do, it lists upgrade the Brancana, Brancana Road, Narrow Water Bridge, Newry Southern Relief Road, and under feasibility st rail extensions to Dungannon and Castle Dawson. Why is there no mention of, say, the Larne Line or extensions to our airports or the Crumlin Line? So how do you think this would stand up to a full equality impact assessment? In short, yes. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Uh, today, in answer to question eight, you told me that the idea that the safety improvement schemes at the main road, Risnevna Road Junction, had been abandoned was untrue. Why then, by reply to question 8474, just four weeks ago on the 20th of uh, December, did you tell me the, the proposed restriction at Main Road has been dropped? Minister. Well, the, the member will want to look at Hansard to clarify. I did not say it was untrue. I said I was not aware of it. Uh, if the member has a correspondence uh, from my department, from myself, that this has been the case. I also went on to say that there are a number of on-site, low-cost remedial actions that will improve the, the safety of that. Um, and as I said, it, this is not a case of misleading the member as he wishes to allude. Mr. Dallister, first supplementary. Well, in terms of things that the minister seems to have forgotten about, can he give us an, uh, an update on the long-awaited park and ride scheme at Cullybecky, particularly now that he tells us there's going to be hourly service through Cullybecky to Londonderry? As I have, I'm more than happy, the, the, we have a number of park and ride facilities across the north that are looking at enhancements. Uh, I have met uh, with some of my colleagues from across the way around Cullybecky and some of the upgrades and to the train line and the situation where I am very pleased to say that we will see in serious uh, enhancements to the park and ride in Cullybecky uh, and these will happen in the months ahead. Call Mr Philip Logan. Thank you Mr Speaker. Uh, can the Minister give me an update on the York interchange please? 
Yes, indeed. No, with a number of uh, my departmental roads priorities, the York Street uh, interchange certainly remains on that. Uh, I recently published my decision to accept the, ind the independent inspector's report, uh, and my department will now begin to engage with the community around a number of the issues that were identified in that report. Mr. Logan, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for the answer. I'm sure the Minister will appreciate it's not only important for those residents, but for those who commute up and down to Belfast uh, and for tourism as well. Uh, would the Minister outline uh, a time schedule uh, for, for work to progress on that? Well, I think there, there are a number of issues that probably make it difficult to outline a very accurate timescale in relation to, to, to moving forward with the York Street interchange, uh, not least that the funding um, difficulties that we faced. I would suggest have been exacerbated by the Prime Minister's statement today around Brexit. It's very clear we're heading for a very hard Brexit uh, of any states. Well, the member, the, member, the member can say here, here to the cows come home, but when farmers lose out uh, on various grants for various things, the cows will be coming home to an empty shed because at the end of the day, we, we were able to facilitate uh, it will buy probably a warm enough shed right enough, but at the end of the day, Europe has been good here to the people of the north with regard to infrastructure projects, and this is one such project uh, which has suffered at the hands of the Brexiteers who cheer on the other side of this house, and that's the situation we find ourselves in today. Mr. Edwin Poots is not in his place. I call Mr. Jerry Carroll. Uh, has the Minister considered under the concessionary fare scheme to introduce free transport for people who are partially sighted uh, and the raids? I've had various conversations with transit officials uh, up until this point over the last number of months uh, on our fare structures uh, and what we can do to enhance passenger numbers. Uh, Translink have taken a number of, uh, I think, exciting and innovative uh, decisions in the run-up to Christmas uh, to attract people on to public transport. This has been hugely successful. The number of people using our metro services has went through the roof. The number of people, which I think most importantly, using the Ulster bus rural services has also went up as well. Uh, so I think there is an onus now uh, on Translink, and certainly I'd be more than happy to work with them over the next number of weeks on developing a system that gets as many people on their public transport as possible, uh, and certainly fares will be very much part of that. Mr. Carl, for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response, and I would just uh, make the point that it's not a very high cost to introduce this in, in parts of England and Scotland. This does exist, and um, I don't know what's going to be the state of play in the next few months, whether the outgoing minister is going to be a minister and a future executive, but if he is, I would ask him to seriously consider introducing this scheme. Thank you. I am more than happy to, to look at schemes that get numbers on um, to our buses, but of course, if, if we look at extending a, a project such as this, uh, it's going to cost money. It's going to cost a lot more money. Um, we have a situation now where, either through Tory austerity uh, or through, as I say, the hardline um, effects of what a hardline Brexit is going to be, and I am aware that the member and his party campaign for a Brexit. Um, these are the sorts of implications that roll out of that. Uh, on the situation that budgets are being hit by this. So there is consequences to some of these decisions. But as I said, the focus of me and my department is getting more pub people on the public transport, making our public transport system more sustainable. And as I said, I'd be more than happy to look at any way of doing that. Call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, uh, could he confirm that the Education Authority would require a permission from the Department for Infrastructure uh, Driver and Vehicle Licence Agency to change the operating licence of Education Authority yellow school buses in order to introduce, introduce bus fares for pupils in Northern Ireland and whether he would oppose the introduction of such unfair charges? I think that may well be the situation, but it is something that I will have to clarify with officials to get back to, to, around the issue of responsibility. Uh, I think there is an avenue here we need to, to, to look at school transport. It is something uh, that, as a party, we have looked at. We spend far too much money on, on school transport. There are no two ways about that. Um, well, we know that for a number of reasons, and we have to look at that. But I, you know, I sympathise with the, the minister and education authorities who are having to deal with their budgets in, the, in that position. Uh, but I think, I, I think there is no doubt there is a way out of this. I have talked to transit officials in recent weeks uh, about delivering um, transport services, such as home-to-school transport, in a more efficient manner. And I think there are ways to do that.
quick supplementary, Mr Little. Perhaps the Minister could clarify whether or not he supports free school travel for our pupils. I said I, I absolutely support the idea that we're practical and you know we're sensible. We need to be transporting our kids in them safe in, in situation. Uh, what I do not uh, agree with is some of the educational policy set down in regards to school transport, where some people can't get a bus two or three miles down the road, but you can be bused halfway across the world um, to go to a particular set of schools. I myself um, at, at times get six buses a day to go to school. I don't think that's right. Uh, I think we need to find a more sustainable way of going forward here when it comes to school transport. But again, I'd probably reiterate, and without straying into the grounds of education, I think we need to find a more sustainable way of doing schools, never mind school transport. That concludes questions to the Minister for Infrastructure.